They're back from the dead, and they are indeed ready to party in Return of the Living Dead. The darkly funny, very grotesque, and always rockin' zombie horror flick that introduced the world to fast zombies who talk quite a bit, and of course crave brains. Much more than a simple regurgitation of the brand of undead ghouls George Romero brought into the world, the Dan O'Bannon directed film is a punk rock freakout, with gore galore, naked zombies, a wild eclectic cast, and a banger of a soundtrack. Not given enough love when first released in the summer of 85, the film is now correctly regarded as a comedy horror classic with enough surreal laughs and disturbing visuals to satisfy any lover of outsider art. But before it was born into the world as a beautiful mohawk baby that it is, there was a long road of behind the scenes drama that almost derailed the project. Hope you're hungry because we're about to wrap our brains around what the f happened to the return of the living dead. As you're probably well aware, the zombie genre as we know it was born when George A. Romero, along with his scrappy crew of Pennsylvanian commercial producers, gifted us with the low-budget nightmare fuel known as Night of the Living Dead, which terrified the world with its remorseless shambling ghouls who wanted nothing more than to snack on the flesh of the living. Ramiro co-wrote the script with John Russo, whom he'd met when the two were going to college in their native Pennsylvania. After the film became a success, it was clear a sequel was in order, but Ramiro and Russo couldn't come to an agreement on how to go about that. After they went their separate ways, the two finally came to an agreement. George could make an official sequel called Dawn of the Dead, while Russo could make unofficial sequels that would use the Living Dead moniker. Russo began to write a script in the early 70s with Russ Streiner and Rudy Ricci, both of whom had worked on Night of the Living Dead. Russo's original vision for his Living Dead saga was set 10 years after the events of Night, and similarly took place in a rural countryside where zombies are back in action. Russo had no luck getting the screenplay turned into a film, so he wrote a novelization and had the book published. Eventually, he sold the rights to an investment banker new to the movie business named Tom Fox who wanted to get the movie made with Russo potentially sitting in the director's chair. With that not working out, the project got a boost when Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Poltergeist director Toby Hooper hopped aboard to direct, and soon the idea morphed into Return of the Living Dead 3D, which was capitalizing on the short-lived 3D fad of the early 80s. Ultimately, Tom Fox made a deal with Orion Pictures and the Hemdale Film Corporation, and he subsequently bought out Russo and his collaborators pursuing other avenues. The new producers evidently thought horror was a dying genre and wanted the script to have more of a comedic vibe, since sophomoric comedies were doing pretty well at the box office in the early 80s. They brought on eccentric screenwriter Dan O'Bannon to rewrite the screenplay. O'Bannon entered the business by co-writing and starring in the absurd sci-fi comedy Dark Star, which was actually directed by John Carpenter. But of course, at this point, he was probably best known for writing the brilliant Alien in 1979. O'Bannon did not like Russo's script at all and felt it was much too close in spirit to Night of the Living Dead and didn't want to impinge on that territory so he did a complete rewrite of the script, with the only remaining similarity being the title and the character being named Bert. Furthermore, he decided to address the elephant in the room by referencing Night of the Living Dead almost immediately, by having his film pretend the Ramiro picture was based on a real incident. Did you know that movie was based on a true case? <laughs> Come on, you're shitting me, right? And incidentally, while the final script has absolutely nothing to do with the original vision John Russo had, he, Rudy Ricci, and Russ Streiner still receive a story credit. Russo eventually wrote the novelization of O'Bannon's script, meaning that he wrote two completely different Return of the Living Dead books in the span of just a few years. With the script in good shape, the producers decided to hire O'Bannon himself to direct the film. 
after Toby Hooper departed to work on Life Force, which ironically O'Bannon co-wrote. While having served as writer, producer, and actor on other projects, and even working on Star Wars, and even the unmade Dune film as a designer, O'Bannon had never directed a film before. He'd later admit that he didn't know what he was doing, but he went into the project with nervous energy and aimed to make the most intense and amusing zombie film he could. Though the film was set in Kentucky, production went down in Los Angeles during a very hot July. Being a talented artist, O'Bannon heavily storyboarded the film, ensuring that director of photography Jules Brenner would know exactly what the director wanted. In a further effort to be as prepared for his directorial debut as possible, O'Bannon made a conscious effort to heavily rehearse the screenplay with his cast. The story goes that they spent as long as two weeks going over the script, so that once production commenced, everyone knew exactly who their characters were and how to play off their co-stars. Even the various sequences of people screaming at each other were carefully orchestrated. As O'Bannon wanted his cast to get in every single word of dialogue that they were supposed to. In regards to the group of actors, O'Bannon cast a wide net and wanted a mix of veteran character actors and young up-and-comers. One of the only holdovers from the Toby Hooper version was James Caron who at that point was perhaps best known for his devious developer role in Poltergeist, as well as a series of Pathmark commercials that any 80s kid will undoubtedly remember. O'Bannon briefly flirted with the idea of casting himself as weird warehouse foreman Frank, but Karen won him over and kept the role. For the younger actors, the casting directors would have them audition together to get an idea of who would have the best chemistry. And soon the cast was set, and I should say most of the cast, because the actor intended to play the main character, Bert, was still missing mere days before the production was set to begin. But thankfully that role ultimately went to Clue Gulliger, a veteran of dozens of TV westerns and movies. A take no BS kind of guy. Gulliger was not enamored with this new project, and he and O'Bannon would infamously be at odds with each other constantly throughout production. So much so that, according to O'Bannon, Gulliger struck the director several times. It got so bad that when Gulliger's character had to walk around with a lead pipe, O'Bannon made the prop people give him a rubber pipe instead, in fear Gulliger would snap and attack him with the real thing. On another occasion, Clue chucked a giant can of something at O'Bannon as he was leaving the room. The can just barely missed him and smashed against the door as it closed. Though I guess we should say allegedly, because for the record this is something that Gulliger has vehemently denied. Evidently, one of the actor's main concerns was that he didn't understand the kind of movie that he was making, unused to working with ghouls and punks as he was. Years later, Gulliger maintained that he loved the final product and that both he and O'Bannon had long since buried the hatchet. Not literally, thankfully. Gulliger wasn't the only person that O'Bannon had issues with. In fact, he didn't get along very well with a handful of actors and crew members on set. He clashed with director of photography Jules Brenner, who was a seasoned pro who felt like he was slumming it on a project beneath him. The DP would even refuse to shoot certain shots that O'Bannon wanted, apparently feeling superior to the director, but somehow, some way, they made it work and ended up with a terrific looking low budget film. Original makeup effect designer William Munns similarly had a bad experience with O'Bannon, who was unhappy with the shabby zombies that Munns had created for the film. Munns was let go early and would later concede that while his work wasn't up to snuff, he was more than happy to leave the contentious production behind. It would be an understatement to say that O'Bannon didn't always get on with actress Beverly Randolph, who plays good girl Tina in the film. Perhaps one way to get off on the wrong foot with an actor is to trick them into falling through a flight of stairs when they're not expecting it, which is exactly what O'Bannon did to Randolph, who was not prepared for the faulty step to give way. In addition, he would end up shooting Randolph falling in a muddy puddle of water countless times, exhausting the poor actress to the point where she couldn't even get up by herself. Randolph later candidly said she cried and shrieked so much for real during production 
that during a climactic scene where her character had to shed tears, she found that she was actually all cried out. O'Bannon would later admit that he was not the most subtle or easygoing of directors, and if you watch enough documentaries about the production, you'll hear some of the cast and crew state he could be cold, prickly, and demanding. Others, however, couldn't have fonder memories of the man and his enthusiasm for what they were doing. Regardless, whatever tension there was on set would lead to an array of believably intense and hyped up performances from the cast. You certainly can't say these folks don't look ready to snap at any given second. When it was all said and done, the $4 million production was completed in six difficult weeks, and the job of editing together a movie that had a very peculiar and particular tone was afoot. To everyone's pleasant surprise, the suits at Orion were pleased with the footage that they saw, and enthusiastically gave the film a summer release date. One problem they were facing was that the zombie godfather himself, George Romero, had his own undead opus, Day of the Dead, coming out during the summer too. In fact, just one month before O'Bannon's picture, while everyone expected the Romero picture to win the Summer of the Dead, it turned out that it was the little zombie movie that could that ended up besting its fearsome competitor. Sin. Return of the Living Dead opened to $4 million, matching its budget on its way to $14 million in domestic sales, while Ramiro's film topped out at $5 million domestically. Four years later, a sequel was spawned, goofier and less exciting than its predecessor. It brought back a couple of cast members, but none of the demented energy O'Bannon instilled in his movie. Three more sequels would be made for the home video market, all wildly different from O'Bannon's original vision. The Return of the Living Dead is beloved by horror fans all across the world, who recognize its twisted genius, with the cast being perennial members of fan conventions year in and year out. Sadly, O'Bannon isn't around to see it, as he passed away in 2009 at the age of 63 after a decades-long battle with Crohn's disease. Though he left us far too early, Plenty of his work will be long remembered by aficionados of imaginative sci-fi horror. Rest in peace, Dan. You may not have looked it, but you were a true punk rock artist. <laughs>